Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is December 12th, 2016. I want to remind listeners to go to econtalk.org where you'll find a link in the upper left-hand corner to this year's annual survey of your favorite episodes. Now for today's guest, author and journalist Sam Quinones. His latest book is Dreamland, the true tale of America's opiate epidemic, which is our topic for today's conversation. Sam, welcome to Econ Talk. Great to be here, Russ. How are you doing? Doing great, uh, especially after reading your book, more or less. It, it, Dreamland is one of the best nonfiction books I have read in a long, long time. Well, thank you. I couldn't put it down. It was deeply disturbing in many ways, but incredibly (laughs) illuminating about an issue that we have touched on a number of times here on the program, which is the opioid epidemic. But I want to start at the beginning, which is actually heroin. Right. Uh, So I want to start with the revolution in the production and distribution of heroin out of Mexico that you describe. And I want to start with the business model of what you call the Jalisco Boys. Jalisco being a small town in a – province of Mexico on the Pacific coast, Narit, and um, it's spelled with an X, X-A-L-I-S-C-O, the Jalisco. Right, not to be dis- not to be confused with the state of Jalisco, which is a very, very large state with Guadalajara at its, uh, as its capital. So talk about, yeah. talk about what uh, came out of Jalisco. Well, right, these guys um, back in the 19, early 1980s, families from this town, a uh, town of about 20,000 people, landed and had migrated to the, the San Fernando Valley of Southern California, Canoga Park, Van Nuys area. A few of these families had figured out how to cook black tar heroin from the opium goo that grows in opium poppies. Opium poppies, you should know, grow very nicely and have for about a century in the north, mounts of the northwest of Mexico. And so Nayarit is a state right on the Pacific coast of Mexico, the northwest. And so they had access to that. They began to learn how to cook the goo into what's called black tar heroin. Black tar is a kind of a uh, a sticky, gooey, semi-processed form of of heroin. Looks like Tootsie Roll kind of. Uh, Every bit uh, bit heroin, just like white powder is. It's just not as processed and filtered and so on. And they began to sell this this, um, heroin in uh, in parks in the San Fernando Valley. A few of these families, not very many. Uh, they would chip off little pieces to the addicts who would, who would come up and buy from them. But in time, a couple of things happened. One was the cops began to get wise to them. They got wise to them because more and more families from this town began to see this as a, a viable business and began to get involved in it. That saturated uh, the market. Now, these guys were different, though. Most, most times you find in, uh, in, the, uh, in the underworld, uh, people um, uh, develop or, or uh, uh, grab market share through the barrel of a gun. Uh, Al Capone started that, I think, and uh, and ever since that's been the way people uh, in in that economy uh, take market share. But these guys couldn't do that because they were all from the same town. They all knew each other. A lot of them were related. Sometimes they had uh, they gone to school together. They everybody knew where each other's mothers lived, so they couldn't use that method. And they so they developed another uh, method, and this really led to the system they developed, which was a, a form of uh, selling heroin that resembled very much pizza delivery. So you, the, the addict, would call a number. They, the, the operator who was standing by to take your order would then dispatch a driver. A driver would meet you at some predetermined place and sell you your heroin. This got them out of the parks. The cops couldn't find them as easily. They also got access to a much larger market uh, of heroin than they would have if they were just a stationary uh, uh, in a park. And in time, that process uh, replicated itself. E- even with cars, they, they, more and more guys come up from this town, uh, more and more people get into the business. And so they have to move beyond even San Fernando Valley. They kind of saturate that given the number of addicts that are in the area. They need to set they, that, that their, the, the business model kind of saturates the market and they have to move to other cities. So first it was Pomona, Ontario, which is about 30 miles east of LA. Uh, I think that when they went to San Diego, uh, a couple uh, Portland, Denver, they began to expand very, very much like any capitalist small business or franchise would. 
Now, talk about the ways they avoided detection. Uh, the first thing as an economist I noticed is they were very price conscious. They they yeah. similar to the crack cocaine uh, distribution, which was a really an innovation in the mag the size of the dose. These the what we're talking about here with the black tar is a tenth of a gram. And talk about how it's sold in balloons and how they uh, use that to avoid detection. Sure, they they um, they were uh, very they, they were not cartel killers. They were not uh, uh, full time drug traffickers. They were kind of guys who thought that this might get they get some next some extra money. They were very aware of not wanting to go to prison. And so um, the way they began to do it was they, they also were retailers, which is really rare in the Mexican drug trafficking world. Most cartel, most organized groups, they sell wholesale. These guys developed a re- they they realized that they had that the profit was really in retail and they began to put the, the the dope in little small little balloons, tie them off, and they would put these balloons in their mouths. Uh, so you could uh, I've talked to guys who actually could put twenty twenty five balloons uh, in their mouths. They look They're not a lot inflated. Like chipmunk. They're not inflated. They're just not inflated. Yeah, They're just, balloons that just wrapped around just to protect the dope in case the cops stop them. That's why they also carried a big jug of water. Uh, the cops stop them. Uh, they they uh, they they begin to sw- sw- swig on the water and, and they swallow the balloons down and the cop doesn't find any any dope on them and that's that's one way they avoided detection. Very important in this in this was also they never used guns. Uh, uh, they they I think learned or uh, uh, or saw uh, the Bloods and the Crips uh, fighting it out for territory in those years for crack territory in Los Angeles and heavy heavy police uh, uh, attack. Uh, on on those folks, they uh, you know the Colombians were the same way, uh, and when they brought their dope into Miami, they they were very uh, uh, much given to, to shootouts and killing lots of people to kill one target. Uh, of course, Al Capone, etc. These guys uh, eschewed guns in completely. They understood first of all that they were not gunmen, but but number two, an illegal immigrant. They were all illegally here in the country. Uh, an illegal immigrant with some dope would be deported. An illegal immigrant with some dope and a pistol would get 10 years in prison. This was very clear to them. So they, they really formed uh, a, a system that, that relied far more on on marketing, on customer service, on making sure that your dope was 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 potent and that your 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 uh, customer got it on on time. They were also these during these early years, the 80s and into the early 90s. They were marketing. They were working during a time when the numbers of addicts, the, the the demand was really small, and so they would go to a new town, say Salt Lake or Portland, and a few of the crews, few of these crews, would get there. They'd compete among each other, but in order to take customers from each other, they couldn't kill each other, so they had to out, you know, market and and do a better job of customer customer service uh, because because they couldn't kill each other. And so they they became master marketers first. Uh, um, very early, uh, very early on, and it, and and this was also part of their way of of developing a market. They developed personal relations. They give you uh, fifty free balloons if you brought them five new customers. Uh, if you bought from me uh, six days of the week, I give you a free one on Sunday. These kinds of come ons and gimmicks, free and, samples, and, and that kind of thing were part of their part of their business. And they gave away free samples. Uh, they'd go to they give away free samples. They hand out, hang out in front of methadone clinics if they knew, and give away free dope there. If they knew a guy well enough, he got out of jail, hadn't been using for three or four months. They'd meet up up at his house, give him free dope there, get him using again. I mean, there's a whole range of ways that they had of marketing and retaining market share that way instead of through the barrel of a gun. So, as a hardcore free market guy, there's a certain respect you have to have for that, but it's um, there's a really dark side to it, which is Heroin addiction is not easy to uh, get out of. In fact, you seem to suggest that you can't, period. Well, I, I'm not sure I would say you can't. I have known people who have. It's just a torment. It's a torment like almost uh, unlike any other, any other drug. It's a, it's a drug that deprives you of rational free will, I believe. I don't believe that when you're fully in addiction, you have that free will, to, particularly to, 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 to heroin. So these guys guys knew that. They, they knew that they were marketing a very potent drug. The other thing that, that I think they knew, too, was this, that they were heroin that used to come to the United States from the Far East, you know, the French Connections type dope, and the, and the well, for the most of the 20th century, really, a lot of it came from Turkey or from Burma or from Vietnam or what have you. Um, a lot of that dope had to change hands many times. By the time it got to the street, 
it was pretty well diluted. Each time it changes hands, the guy to make his money, he, he cuts it and he sells it for double. You know, he makes it one kilo into two or four and he sells it for double and makes a lot of money. That, that's how you make your money. And so for, the, for many, many years, the DEA always found when they did their tests on the heroin that they would seize on the street, that the potency was six to maybe 15 to 18 percent, something in, in that ballpark. These guys were hard, were making the heroin. Their family members were making it. They were taking it themselves up through the border. Heroin's very, very easy to smuggle across because it's so condensable. And it would get to the United States in very, very potent form. Uh, they were not uh, uh, they were not diluting it uh, so much as 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 the dope that would come from say Burma or someplace. It didn't have as far to go. You know, heroin is a commodity. It's not like a red wine or marijuana, which has a lot of varietals. It's one thing, and the, the price really depends on how much you've diluted it and how far it had to travel. And in this case, they didn't dilute it very much at all, and it had only maybe two thousand miles to travel instead of twelve thousand miles, say. And so it got here much more potent and much and much cheaper, and that's what made their heroin very, very uh, popular. So I have a couple of prices in the book. At one point, you mentioned 25 doses for $100, five doses for 100 Obviously, it depended on the city and what level of competition yes. there was. But Completely. But how, how, many, how many doses would a user who is in bad shape be using a day? Uh, usually about a gram to, to a gram and a half, so it could be um, – Six to eight to it depends. Uh, uh, you know, I would say six to eight doses a, a day, perhaps something like that. Um, I found different different people in different states, uh, honestly, uh, in my in my book. Can a person? But it would, it would, go ahead. Um, per person, right? Yeah, and you, so that's the thing about heroin. That's what makes it a magnificent drug for drug traffickers. It it, sh- it really has no medicinal um, uh, use. Uh, compared to other opiates from the same opium poppy, the heroin is extraordinarily uh, addictive and has more or less the same painkilling qualities um, and, and, and th- as others. But it's far more addictive because it takes you up and down your your you, 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 euphoria and then you crash very quickly. So you need to be doing it two, three, four, five times a day sometimes. Uh, and that's what leads to the addiction. That's what makes it very, very appealing to a street trafficker because he's got a customer who's going to hit him up every day. There's no day on Christmas, on Sundays, you're not saying, oh, well, maybe I won't use today. No, you're using every day. You cannot not use this drug. And sometimes it's three, four, five times a day. And, and it also drives people to extraordinary ends. They're willing to to sell anything. They're willing to uh, find any client. Uh, if it'll get them more free dope, That's that they'll do it. Uh, a lot of the, these guys spread the way they spread their, the way they expanded to other cities was really with guides who were addicts. Addicts were their guides. He took them, said, told them, man, you bring this stuff to Reno. I know where the methadone clinic is there. And man, we could make a killing there. And you just give me my free dope. That's all I care about. You know, can, can a person hold down a job as a heroin user? Uh, you can. Uh, and what I found was that these guys changed that though. I met guys, for example, addicts who would say back when it was hard to get, I kind of had a, back when heroin was more difficult to get um, and was, it was far more expensive and was far more diluted. I, I was able to do uh, more with my life. I was able to hold on a job more or less uh, relative, you know, more or less handle of uh, family responsibilities and this kind of thing uh, because it was hard to get. It was either really expensive or the places that I had to go to get it were dangerous like some, you know, forbidding little bar or some uh, strange, uh, unappealing motel or housing project or what have you. Uh, But once these guys made it easy, that's when it just went off the rails for a lot of these guys. So so it made it easy in, in several ways. First of all, they made it cheaper. They would give you free dope from time to time to keep you using, and they were they all all it was was a was a was a phone call away. I remember I talked to one guy who had no legs. He had, because of his long addiction, he had one day uh, frozen, almost frozen to death in, in a storm, had lost his legs. And so before these guys showed up, he had prosthetics. He had to hobble around downtown Portland three times a day to get his dope, to get his dope. To, and, and, and he didn't know what kind of quality it was going to be. He thought they might, people would rob him occasionally. I mean, it was just a, a torment. These guys show up and it's magnificent. You know, these guys will 
they're a phone call away. Yeah, I don't have to walk out of my motel to go hobble down down downtown Portland. Um, I will. I, they, they are cheap and frequently they give me free dope. They're clean. They're not going to rob me. They're nice guys. They're polite. On and on like this. And it was almost like he said, as if I died and gone to heaven. These guys were the best dealers I'd ever seen. They gave me free dope. I could con them out of free dope, et cetera. Right. And 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 so his his use became kind of went off the rails. It's the, the convenience, the access to easy availability and so cheap supply is what really, really uh, put, push people over the edge a lot of time. And of course, as you mentioned in the book, uh, none of these drivers who are typically young kids, young men from this one town, um, they're not using. Uh, they're no. not, they don't sell to black people. They, they're afraid of them right. for whatever right. reason. They're racist. They only right. sell to white people. Did they ever sell to fellow Mexicans? Because they need a Mexican community no, to hide no, among. No, no, they, no, they and didn't. why not? First of, all, first of all, in the Mexican community, the level of heroin addiction is microscopically small. I, I don't know too many. Now, in the Mexican-American community, it's a little bit different. But um, even so, uh, this is a white person's problem all across the country. I mean, the, the pill problem, the, the opiate addiction problem is really white people. Um, no, they, they are they are a rare breed in in the heroin world uh, retailer the heroin retailer world because most of the time up to up to then and I've had many cops in different cities tell me this your typical heroin dealer was an addict he was stationary he was in a house he was in a bar or motel or someplace um, and and he was very easy to arrest and very easy to investigate the only problem was you know, back then no one bothered because it was such a small problem. These guys come along, and and they are they don't use, they are uh, uh, they're in and out. They're very quick. They're they're not uh, you know hanging out. They're not partying. They're not causing a ruckus. Uh, they're not calling attention uh, to themselves. And and they don't hang out in one place. So, they don't have a bar or a house or something like that where they sell their dope. So as you point out, there's a poignance <clears throat> and uh, credible poignance to the fact that uh, it's culturally. Uh, repugnant to these folks to to be a user. The yeah. idea that that they are helping often children, high schoolers and teenagers, get heroin is repugnant to them because they would not yeah. want their own children, of course, to be doing this. And yet they come anyway because it's very lucrative, and they come for very short periods of time. So talk about the motivation of these uh, the young men who come from this one town. Their cultural aspirations, their alternatives. Uh, well, a little bit about what yeah. life is like in the town because it's, no, it's very, it's very interesting stuff. That's that's what I I knew most about that when I started this book. That they come from an area. A lot of these folks, when the, uh, immigrants in general, when they come to the United States, they are not the poorest of the poor. They are people who have. So they're kind of working class folks. They have some resources, some assets, but not not a lot. And all around them, they are seeing people who are doing better. Um, by by going north, uh, in the immigrants' case, to work as landscapers. Say, in this case, you guys come north and sell 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 heroin. But when they when they these guys come back home, the guys who've gone north, they set a new standard for achievement. That what you, in order to be seen as having um, overcome poverty, you now need to to be building yourself a house. For immigrants, Mexican immigrants all across Mexico, they build houses, hundreds of thousands of houses, maybe millions of houses all across Mexico because of that. And, and that becomes the norm, the standard by which you're judged because you are not interested in becoming American. You are not interested in, in doing anything more than going home and showing the people who humiliated you when you were young that this is what I'm really capable of. This house that I'm building is what I'm really capable of. Now, that's the immigrants' impulse all across Mexico, I would say. I've studied this many years, wrote two books about it. I think this is a very, very important impulse with when it comes to drug trafficking the impulse is the same it's just that the risks and the rewards are many times greater and so you go north to sell dope and you come home and you build a house that might take a a, a, a regular immigrant nine years to build you do that in nine months because you have the wherewithal you have the capital you don't have to build room by room room uh, one room a year you build it all in nine months and and you build uh 
you build nice things like wrought iron and automatic garage door openers and, and, and that, that kind of thing. What that does then is set the standard, set the bar very, very high for the other kids who are still poor in your town or still kind of scuffling and wanting something who no girl will talk to, who is not respected, their, their dad's an alcoholic or their dad's just a scuffling sugarcane farmer. These guys now have to reach this level, not the, not the level of a, of a house that it takes nine years to build, but one that takes nine months to build. And a lot of these guys have available to them only the most dead-end work in Mexico, sugar can farming, bakery work, uh, uh, butcher, uh, uh, construction, uh, avocado farming, et cetera. These things lead nowhere in Mexico, and they're not viewed as, as, as very respect, as, as uh, you know, jobs that people are really uh, love to do. So these guys all became uh, basically two generations of this town, I think, became heroin traffickers up in the United States, and they all then went back home. They all brought their money back home. They all built houses, not lavish mansions. We're talking about middle-class houses. This is a system to turn you, make you, transform you from a poor person into a middle-class person, not into some drug kingpin. And, and everybody then, um, they would come home, and they would be the kings for six weeks or two months or whatever it was, and all the girls then wanted to talk to them. And, and they, they could buy a, used, a good used truck, and they could build a house, a small house, for uh, in nine months instead of, instead of nine years. And, and this became kind of what, what drove these kids forward. And then also once the other thing that was amazing to me, I thought it was so fascinating, was that once they'd, already, they'd, they'd, they'd done this once, they come back, they too get addicted, except for it's not to the drug. It's to the feeling of coming home a king, coming home a man of respect, coming home with a trunk full of Levi's 501 jeans and passing them out among your nephews and your brothers-in-law and what have you. Uh, that was their drug. And so they'd spend their money and they'd be like a junkie without, without any dope. And they'd have to go back to the United States to earn more money to come back and be the king for six weeks again. It was a fascinating um, uh, a peek into what really drives drives people. A lot of it is psychology and aspiration. And these are young, uh, young men typically. Uh, and puzzle I had reading it. So the profits at one point you mentioned it takes about two thousand dollars of of time and equipment to cook a kilo of black tar heroin. About fifty thousand dollars to maintain the apartment and the car for the people and pay the drivers. So for the person who's the distributor of the of to the drivers, sort of manager of the town, uh, of a certain number of drivers, uh, there's a hundred and fifty thousand roughly of revenue. So there's mm-hmm. a huge profit. It's fifty two thousand in yeah. cost, about a hundred thousand in profit. So normally right. competition drive will drive that down. Of course, if it's dangerous, it doesn't get mm-hmm. driven down very far. But I'm wondering why other Towns didn't com- compete. Why? Uh, <laughs> given that there's that's no, a very good question. Right? Yeah, D- is I, it I'm just not the technology sure. of I, cooking it? Is it what they figured out that no, no one else has figured out? No, that's more like a folk craft. You can you can cook black tar heroin from opium, the opium goo that you harvest from the opium poppy, and cook it into black tar heroin. I've seen film of this. The EA actually has a confiscated film that I I, I have. That, in which the guy's cooking as if it were a barbecue. It's like a big barbecue grill, and he's got a couple of pots going. And, and, and no, it's not hard at all. I, I, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, in, in those areas, a lot of people were already um, g- going north to work. Uh, this is a very uh, area of very heavy immigration to the United States, so they were already involved in other, other jobs. Uh, bl- heroin is viewed, again, get back to kind of the... the the way it's 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 viewed in Mexico is that the low life, most low life, scuzziest back alley drug, and so getting involved in that is, it, um, you know, and it t- it does take I think um, a fair amount of of um, knowledge uh, of kind of uh, a, a breadth of knowledge that that is developed over many years, trial and error. There's no book. They didn't. They didn't use a book to to figure out this system. It's uh, what'll get you arrested. Let's not do that anymore, and let's try something else. You know. I mean, it was uh, so. I'm I'm not sure. I, I I know. I do know though that at a certain point, what what started with a few families had to expand to many many other families. So for the first fifteen twenty years of the life of this thing, um, a lot of these guys there was the same last names: Hernandez, Tejeda, uh, Garcia Langarica, a few others, uh, Diaz Bernal. These kinds of last names. 
and they all were kind of were connected and they were all related uh, 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 to each other. Sancho's family was a big one. Um, but then they had the, the DEA first figured these guys out in, in late 99 and 2000. And they held the first big nationwide bust. It was the first time, in fact, that when they busted these guys in a, in a thing called Operation Tar Pit, it was the first time that the DEA and the FBI had actually worked together on a, on a, and, and found a drug ring that, that was, went coast, coast, literally coast to coast, from North Carolina to, uh, to Reno and Los Angeles and Phoenix, et cetera. And uh, they arrested, um, uh, I can't remember now, right now as I talk to you, maybe 200 people. And with that, the families that ran those crews had to find more labor. Uh, a lot of those people went to prison, federal prison, for some for significant sentences, 10, 15 years. Uh, so they had to, and so what they began to do was expand to new families, families that had never been involved. And at 2000, the year 2000, just as the United States is developing a very he healthy appetite for, for opiate, um, opiates of all kinds, they have to now expand throughout. And so it's not so much just Jalisco and a few of the little villages around there. They sometimes have to take labor from towns in other counties and, and people that they know. And, and, and I found a few of those as well. But it, it, be, it happened because their labor source, their labor supply was, was in one fell swoop sent to, sent to, sent to prison. And, and so they needed to kind of uh, fill the ranks with, with new folks. Now, you went to Jalisco undercover, uh, pretend you were not a journalist. Uh, right. Just, um, so First time I've ever done that, by the way. Yeah, Anytime people ask me, I say I'm a journalist, except for there. I was uh, – You're scared. Not going to do that there. Reasonably. Um, so you have you went to Jalisco. You've talked to these drivers. Uh, I think you've talked to users. It's, a, it's an incredible bit of reporting, and that's – that's half the book. Uh, that would make a fantastic book, but it's uh, it just uh, gets more interesting because there's an intersection with the opioid problem. So let's talk right. about let's switch gears. Let's talk about painkillers. Sure. Um, how did uh, painkillers become a problem? W what it seems like there was this great new set of painkillers out, OxyContin and others. Why did they end up getting uh, misused and abused? Yeah, that was the. You know, I, I backed into this story because of my background in Mexico. I really focused first on the heroin traffickers. But then, of course, I was left with the question, why is it that there are so they have so much new demand? Because they were now by then, by the, by the time I was doing it, they were now in Ohio and West Virginia and places like that. And, I just, and, and so that got me on to this other story. There's really the first story, a really far larger Story and that begins really in in the in the 1980s as well, about the same time, when um, uh, pain management is just beginning to be um, a, a new, kind of a new uh, a discipline within medicine that you study, and a, a whole group of pain specialists began to um, uh, form a collective consciousness and began to believe that the, we were not treating pain correctly, that there were these pills, opiate painkillers out there, and doctors all across the country were, uh, un, uh, were, 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 were unwilling to use these and that this was not a reasonable uh, uh, proposition, that these, these pills ought to be far more liberally used. And, and at first they made the argument, uh, we need to use these for hospice care folks, people dying of cancer and whatnot. Uh, in order to improve their last months on, on Earth, um, uh, what does it matter if they're addicted to these pills? Who cares if they're addicted to these pills if they also live the last three months of their lives pain-free? And that made a lot of sense. That was a very logical argument. The folks would die in utter pain because doctors were afraid they would be addicted. But these folks made a different argument. They, however, kept pushing and that's probably uh, – that's why we're here today. Um, they, they didn't stop with just hospice care. Uh, they said – they began to make the argument that virtually all of these pills – these pills are – we now know. Science now knows that, you know, 5,000 years of op experience with the opiate po – opium poppy be down. We now know that these pills are virtually non-addictive when used to treat pain. And so they began to push – they were joined in this after a while by certain pharmaceutical companies who were producing some of these pills, main one being um, uh, uh, Purdue Pharma, which makes the pill OxyContin. And they be took up the, the call of these guys. I had one doctor say, if it hadn't, if it hadn't been for the, pharmace for the pain specialists, the pharmaceutical companies would have had nobody to, to, to footnote, to use, to point to, to say, this is why we're doing these. We're producing these pills, but it had not been for the had it not been for the pharmaceutical companies, 
they would these pain specialists would have would have been without a megaphone and and so the the com- combination of those two together p- particularly as the mid- 1990s progress becomes very very um uh potent they they begin to argue that we're a country in pain uh virtually non addictive now when used to treat pain we need to 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 revolutionize our treatment of pain and then and the game changer comes with uh as you say oxycontin Oxycontin was a game changer for a couple of reasons. The main one, one was that, that it was promoted by Purdue Pharma almost the way you would promote an over-the-counter medicine to doctors with lots of giveaways and discounts, very much, as I got into my research, very much reminiscent of the, the, the come-ons and discounts and stuff that the Jalisco boys would use to sell their heroin um, to their patients and keep and, um, to their, I'm sorry, their customers. Customers, yeah. And keep, Yes, right. And, and, and so they, a lot of these kinds of come-ons and this kind of thing, and, and uh, uh, they had a CD they gave away called Swing in the Right Direction with Oxycontin. It was a bunch of swing band tunes, you know, and um, it was this new kind of approach to marketing uh, a drug, but it was an opiate, highly addictive, but they were using the, the idea that these drugs were virtually non-addictive, which was gaining credence in medicine. They were helped also by medical establishments, uh, JCO that accredits hospitals came up with the idea that now doctors should use pain, should consider pain to be the fifth vital sign. So that you should treat it just as you would treat pulse or heartbeat or that kind of thing. But uh, respira- yeah. you know, you, you, all these things should be treated the same and therefore pain is something you should be always treating. There was a, pre- a, a patient evaluation. So there was this whole culture uh, around the idea that we were first a country in pain, and what's more, that we were not treating it properly, and w- finally that we had the tools, but we had just been afraid to use them, and that were that that was these these opiate painkillers, and of course the new one was uh, oxycontin. And as you point out, millions of people who were in horrible pain weren't anymore. So that was that was the good side. Uh, yeah. The bad side was the promised non-addictive aspect of OxyContin, which was the slow release part. The idea that yeah. it was Contin continuous was supposed right. to dampen the addictive part. Uh, the two things happened. One, uh, people figured out a way to get around that by sucking off the coating that slowed the release mm-hmm. or hitting it with a hammer. Uh, so that was problem number one. Problem number two is, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, there were people who – get addicted anyway, even though it was slow release. Yes, right. They were following doctor's orders and they would still get, get, get addicted. And, um, and, and part of the problem too was that along with the idea that these pills were no longer um, uh, uh, addictive when used to treat pain came the corollary, what was, which was then that there's no limit on dose. So you began to see all across the country doctors, for example, prescribing enormous quantities of these pills for patients to take home with them after acute surgery, after acute, for acute pain after surgery. Now, this is pain that's probably going to last you, oh, no more than three to five days. It lasts more than five days or something else wrong. But they would prescribe 30 days worth of like Vicodin or, or, or Oxycontin. These are common you know, Avicodin is another common uh, uh, opiate painkiller. And, um, and so what happened is you, an enormous, and this was ha- happening all across the country, an enormous new supply was, of opiates was created all across the country. And a, a fair amount of that, a good amount of that leaked out into the black market. Uh, I believe this is, uh, 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 when, when I was in Mexico, I believe that all drug stories were demand driven. And the drug scourges were created by demand for those drugs. Now, when I did this book, that this changed my mind. Honestly, it, it, I became to, it came to think that really most drug problems begin because of excess supply, easy, cheap availability of a of a drug, and that's exactly what happened. What happened here? We have a new, a massive new supply of of, an, of opiate painkillers. Uh, from from coast to coast, all across the country, because it's doctors who buy into this idea. As a as a, a couple genera again, a couple generations of doctors buy into the idea that they now need to very aggressively uh, prescribe these things to treat our pain. And and some some are pushed or pressured legally. You have to do this. If you don't treat pain, you can be sued. Some it's it's insurance pressures. If if we don't push people through our, our, our clinic. We won't be able to, to, to reimburse enough to make the, keep the lights on. Uh, but, but whatever the case, doctors all across the country come to this idea 
that they need to do this. And that is what creates in a massive and continuous uh, new supply of opiate painkillers for the last 20 years from coast to coast. So a couple of, um, of important footnotes. It's the same molecule really as heroin, correct? All of these are just it's variations. All, all these drugs are derived from the opium goo, the opium poppy, the goo that, that the opium poppy produces. So they all have molecularly, their molecular structure is more or less the same. They have the same, they, they do a very good job of killing pain and they are extraordinarily uh, uh, addictive and they have, you know, when you get off of them, they cause withdrawals. They have the same effect on the brain chemistry, no matter whether it's hydrocodone, uh, oxycodone, heroin. There's some differences, but, but, but by and large, they are all come from the same poppy. They're so all derived the, from the opium poppy. The, the idea, which sounds reasonable, uh, was that if you're in pain, the drug merely yeah. covers the pain and, and doesn't produce euphoria. If you yeah. continue to take the drug after the pain, then you can get addicted. But it turned out, of course, that we weren't – we really don't understand why people yeah. get addicted in the first place. So it's right. not just – pain is not sufficient to avoid addiction to these drugs, uh, evidently. It is for some people. And for others, it isn't. This is the problem. They, they, we, we, tr we, we applied the fire hose approach. Right? You just blast everybody with opiates. And for some, that's fine. And a lot of people probably are listening to this now go, yeah, I didn't have any problem with it. And it's probably true. But there's an awful lot of people who do. And it's figuring out who's who beforehand that's the tricky question. Like, is this a person who, who ought to, to, uh, to get this much? And, and, and doctors were not doing that. A lot of doctors didn't have time to do that. Time is the crucial thing that we have lost in modern American medicine. You do not have time as a primary care doc in most parts of America to sit down and ask a, a, a patient all the questions that really will allow you to come to a really clear idea of whether or not this person should get this quantity. And then if that person should get this quantity over a period of time, they have shown, I think, there are studies that show that there is a um, very high incidence a uh, risk of addiction if you are given these drugs exposed to these drugs no matter who you are over I, I believe it's more than 90 days if you get 100 milligrams a day more than 90 days something like that um i, I don't have it in front of me right now but but the, 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 the risk of addiction is very very high no matter who you are but but you know the problem is we 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 applied the fire hose approach, but this is a very nuanced nuanced problem. Pain is a very very nuanced issue, and you got to spend time. It's individual. It's every person's different, and it does not. Uh, uh, when you try to apply a fire hose to everybody, things just don't go well. So, just a couple of uh, data points from Wikipedia, which you can I think are consistent with the ones you mentioned in the book. It says yeah. uh, in the U.S., more than 12 million people use opioid drugs recreationally. In 2010, 16,652 deaths were related to opioid over overdose. Uh, in 2007, about 42,800 emergency room visits occurred due to episodes involving oxycodone. So it's a serious problem, and in particular, uh, particularly tragic, uh, young people in particular geographic areas where usage was – access was much easier uh, – uh. Just thousands of lives were ruined and eventually – And continue to be. And continue to be. By the way, this is something that – you know, the, the CDC just put out information that shows that we have now, now more heroin-related deaths uh, than gun homicides in 2015 as a country. I mean that's a, a spectacularly – Tragic. Uh, yeah. uh, a tragic thing. It just mind, blows my mind. So talk about um, – talk about how the – heroin distribution started to interact with the opioid uh, distribution? Sure. The, the reason I write about the, the Jalisco boys, these, as I call them, these guys who developed this system for selling heroin uh, a lot like pizza delivery, is not because they're the only heroin traffickers from Mexico, uh, nor is it really that they're the only black tar heroin traffickers from Mexico. The reason I, did, I wrote about them was for two reasons. One was that, uh, really that they developed this kind of new way of trafficking that was based on marketing now. Very heavy on marketing, almost no violence. No violence at all. Just the, the violence is bad. It can get us a lot of prison years. We forget about that. Um, but the other reason is because they, as they expanded, as they were going through this kind of capitalist expansion 
um, uh, uh, mode through the 1990s. They jumped the Mississippi River. They're the first ones to bring mis- uh, black tar heroin east of the Mississippi River in the history of that drug, uh, according to the DEA. They're the first ones to jump the Mississippi River, and they do this. One guy, does, one guy who I interviewed in the book does this in 1998. Now, that's a crucial year because it's just at that moment when this pain, this revolution in pain management is really taking hold, and when in the area of Columbus to the north, Cincinnati to the west, West Virginia, eastern Kentucky, though that very, very roughly drawn area, that is the area where Purdue Pharma is first very aggressively promoting and marketing OxyContin. And you're finding now lots of people beginning to get addicted, and all of a sudden, they land in an area, pure coincidence, there's no conspiracy here. They just happen to land in an area where, for the first time, they find a huge number of growing population of, of addicts and in a growing demand. They don't, and so, um, so they are the first ones to recognize and then systematically exploit the coming market for heroin that this massive kind of fire hose approach to, a, to, to a prescribing uh, opiate pain pills uh, implies, uh, and and they just hang out in Columbus, and they, they, they and they, they this guy tells me, you know, I, at first it was amazing. I was just doing this business. I had two guy, two kids up there driving for me, and I was t- I was lying to them all, all my friends back home. I was saying, no, uh, I'm in New York City, or I was telling them all kinds of lies about where I was. I, the last thing I wanted to kn- them to know was that I was in Columbus, Ohio. But then these kids go back home. They come back home with lots of money for the parties. They're showing off from the girls. And pretty soon everybody gets the idea, oh, Columbus is the place to go. And, and within uh, a year or two, I think about two years of, of his first arrival in, in, uh, in, in the summer of 1998, uh, you know, Columbus is, is beginning to get one crew after another. And I think lately, I mean, it, it comes and goes, but I think they got 10 or 12 crews working uh, from this one town in, in uh in, uh, in Columbus or had the last I heard anyway. And, um, and also, so they, and they begin to bring, you know, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating story. Oxycontin is a game changer be- for, for another reason, not just how it's marketed, but because before Oxycontin, people would mess around with low dose Vicodin and Percocet, but those have acetaminophen and they have Tylenol in them. If you develop a large, uh, uh, addiction to, to those, uh, you will destroy your, your internal organs. Oxycontin has none of that. So it takes people up to very, very large, uh, addiction, uh, uh levels, daily addiction levels. So you have to be doing a hundred, 200, 300 milligrams a day of these pills. That's a dollar a, a milligram on the street. So it's a hundred, 200, 300 milligrams a day. Well, you can't sustain that. You can, there's no way you can, can continue with that. So you begin to look to, for something very cheap and just as potent. And cheap Mexican heroin fills that bill perfectly. And their heroin fills that bill absolutely. And it's easy to get and it's uh, available and they'll, they'll give you free come-ons and discounts, et cetera. And so it's that kind of uh, uh, encounter between the, the heavy marketing of pain pills and Purdue Pharma and the pill mills were beginning in that area as well. Uh, and then the encounter of these these new heroin traffickers with this new system and this very cheap, very potent dope that creates the first examples of what we're now seeing all across the country, in almost in every state of the union, which is people getting addicted first to pills and then transitioning to very cheap Mexican heroin. It's not always the Jalisco boys do, uh, selling it in every state, but that's where you first see it. That's ground zero, that whole region uh, south of Columbus, Ohio. So there's a lot of things to talk about here, but I just want to make sure I get this question in because it's uh, it haunted me while I was reading your book, which is uh, I have very limited experience with uh, opiates of any kind. And so I can't yeah. really – I once had a root canal and I had codeine afterwards with, with Tylenol, and it was really pleasant. I really – it was blissful. Uh, the pain went away. I slept incredibly well. That's that's really about it for me. So I'm not a very good data point. But after I read your book, I did find myself uh, because there's so many teenagers and young people who, who whose lives are ruined or who died tragically in this book. And it, I want to tell listeners, mm-hmm. it's not a sensationalist book at all. One of the great reasons it's such an effective book is that it's not sensational. Uh, your imagination does a lot of the the uh, work in it. It's really a it's a it's a police uh, kind of. Uh, book. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. uh, what's, what's the right word? It's a um, can't remember the word. But anyway, well, I try not to use adjectives. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
It's a procedural book. So I, I found myself calling my kids uh, off of college and, and telling them, uh, you know, try to avoid these drugs if you need them. And my question is, and, and certainly stay away from – if somebody offers you a balloon of, of black tar heroin for free, don't take it, uh, which is obviously pretty good advice. But I found myself wondering if they had surgery of some kind, and you'd give many examples of this, where some kid in football team gets shoulder separation and he gets prescribed drugs by a doctor to take care of the pain, and he ends up dead. Uh, yeah. And right. so would you counsel your children? Would you yourself take – these opioids in the aftermath of well, surgery? Well, look, it, you know, first of all, I'd have to, it, it, it's incumbent upon doctors to know the person um, and know what they're, and, and so that is a big thing. And, know, and parents, for their, them to know, know their kids. With, with, with regard to athletics, you're absolutely right. See, uh, uh, this pain revolution has tr- transformed football into a gateway to heroin addiction because football is a sport that creates pain. chronic pain, creates <laughs> pain. And um, and also, it, it, along with that, though, there is very often the intense desire to get back on the field. And this is not just the, the, the coach. This could be very oh, easily sure. the player and could be very easy the, the friends and the, the parents That's and the sure. siblings and all. And my feeling is if there is, a, um, if there is that kind of injury, the only, your body knows, we all know. If you get a shoulder separation or something, like that, there's there's one way of curing that, and that is time. And you just have to make sure that you understand that you cannot continue for months to take these pills. Um, they they are not pills to be taken for months. They are magnificent. I think doctors will tell you they are magnificent for post surgery surgery pain that lasts three or four days, and they just are. That's what they're made for, really, if you ask me. And for hospice care and some some small part of chronic pain. But 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 if a doctor is saying, as as somebody told me when I had my appendix out, here's sixty Vicodin, thirty days worth of Vicodin, take as needed. That that you need to ask questions. You need to say what what's in Vicodin? Tell me that, doctor. Would you know? And 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 why does sixty? Why not six? If this is acute pain, why not three days worth instead of thirty? Days worth, say, you know. I want to emphasize. Um, I want to emphasize. This is not a medical program, of course. Anything we're saying no. here, folks out there, uh, take with many grains of salt. But um, I would just, uh, I would counsel everyone listening to be careful and to ask questions and to not yeah. um, take anything for granted. It's, uh, it was, it's a chilling. And, and, and to <laughs> also understand that we need to be. One of the great things about this story of, that I learned was. This story, doctor, doctors get a lot of blame for it. But, you know, a big part of why this happened was because we Americans didn't want to be accountable. We didn't want to be accountable for our own consumer choices, for our own um, uh, behavior. We didn't – doctors would say uh, – t- talk to any doctor. I think any doctor, primary care doctor, would give you some amazing stories on this. Uh, people come in, well, I have pain, doc. Well, doc says, well, you need to eat better. You need to exercise more. You need to start swimming. You need to stop smoking Etc. It's a bunch bunch of things like that. Do yoga. Do you know whatever? And um, and people do not want to do that. That's why pills were so appealing. Magic. These opiate painkillers were so appealing as a, as a solution because most of the patients wanted the easy way out. So I, and, um, I want to talk about we another, need to be accountable. I want to talk about another part of the problem. And yeah, I certainly agree that we have a certain cultural problem here with. Um, Suffering, delayed gratification, you name it. We, oh, if we boy. can avoid it, we want, to, we want to avoid it, which is human. We all understand that. It's one of the curses of being wealthy. But there, there's a piece of the story that was just extraordinary to me. I'm going to try to spin it out, and you can then fill it in. So there were these doctors. And by the way, I've, I felt like I'd done this interview by myself, uh, Sam. I've, I've told this ex- excerpts from your book to way too many people. Ask my, my family <laughs> about it. They're, they're getting a little tired of dreamland. But um, – <laughs> But so these well, doctors, you. you've got these doctors in what are called pill mills, particularly in areas yeah. of Ohio and Kentucky, West Virginia, depressed areas economically, people having trouble finding work. And the doctors set up shop. They're going to dispense a prescription every three minutes uh, because they want to make money. Right. They're, right. they're they're not reliable, honest doctors. They're just going to write prescriptions. They're going to say, are you in pain? Yeah. Yes. Good. Here's a prescription. The pres- it takes three minutes. So you're doing about 20 patients an hour. People are lined up. Addicts and others are lined up to get at these drugs. Right. The, to see the doctor, I just want to talk about the financial side of this. To see the doctor is a $250 cash payment. 
Right. No insurance accepted. Correct. So you show up, you give the doctor $250 that maybe you've stolen or fenced or whatever from whatever. And then uh, that gives you the, the piece of paper the doctor gives you, gives you the opportunity to buy OxyContin, a supply yeah. that's going to cost about $1,000 for, I forget right. how long a supply is this, three, a month or three months, I can't remember. But a, a mm-hmm. long supply of it. Could be a month. A month, let's say $1,000. Well, you don't have $1,000, but you do have a Medicaid card, and the copay right. for Medicaid is $3, which seems like a right. very nice, thoughtful thing. But what it means <clears throat> is is that the taxpayer is going to cover $997 of this. The addict's right. going to cover three. And then the punchline, that's interestingly by, interesting by itself. And as an economist who's often talked about the value of cash, I can't help but – Note the irony that we give people Medicaid because we don't want them to have cash as a way to use it on drugs and alcohol. So there's an incredible tragedy here. So they take the $3 copay, they get $1,000 worth of drugs, and it's worth $10,000 on the street. Something like that, right? So, exactly. You know, this is the this is the, um, uh, the the this is what happened in in many parts of that area that I first that I talked about as ground ground zero Rust Belt area Appalachian area, and I believe one of the reasons for that was it because was because uh, uh, Purdue figured out that it was in those areas. When they were first starting to market uh, um, uh, OxyContin, you know, in those areas, doctors were already prescribing a lot of drugs. And the reason for that was because doctors had become the, the uh, connection, the, the, the crucial element in navigating economic catastrophe. You needed a doctor to get workers' comp. You needed a doctor Disability. signing off on you to disability, all those forms of disability. Now, for a long time, disability was... Uh, desirable because you got a, you know, SSI. It's desirable because you get a $500 check every month. It's not a lot of money, but I mean, that's what people thought. The pill, the pill revolution transformed the calculus of why you would want SSI or SSDI or what have you, because it gave you, as you said, the Medicaid insurance card. And all of a sudden, if you could find a doctor to prescribe you a long list of, of, of drugs, Vicodin, Moxycontin, Xanax, et cetera, et cetera. It went went on and on. That you could make a ton of money and get high all month too. And yes, it was it was uh, it was uh, uh, the taxpayer money was kind of uh, funding uh, was funding this in 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 certain areas among 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 certain people. It was a big way that it began to spread uh, early on. I think it's still used uh, uh, in some areas. Because- but it was because doctors were so used to they, they were almost economic. Uh, counselors themselves or job counselors themselves, doctors in a certain point, because all the people that were coming to them were, were being laid off or were threatened to be laid off. There was all these, this grave concern about how am I going to navigate economic disaster and catastrophe in our region? Well, doctors were it, and they were already used to prescribing a lot of drugs. And so when Purdue came along, it was, it, it met a very fertile, you know, tender terrain there. And, and, and that's why, the, that, that's why that area, I believe, that's one of the reasons why that area was kind of ground zero for all this. Yeah, this you mentioned earlier that that these drugs were cheap, like like the heroin. They were cheap to the user. They weren't yeah. cheap. They were expensive. But so there was this really unhealthy symbiotic relationship between right. the drug company and the doctors who were benefiting from this, and the users who were basically. Funding this habit out of this structural process of disability and Medicaid payments. Right, and, and all of it dis- dealing with subsidy. primarily, in my opinion, dealing primarily with, with economic cataclysm. I mean, these are areas where we're losing mainstay jobs, yep. uh, never coming back. And um, this was a way of navigating uh, that. I would also say this, that, you know, what was interesting about this too, I thought, was that these pills were first presented and marketed as a boon to doctors. Docs, here's the solution to those patients who take up all your time that you don't have. And, and we're, you know, this is going to be a great thing for you guys. And this, and it turned out really that in the long run, it was a, it was a horrible curse for doctors. First of all, in a lot of cases, it made doctors lazy, just throw pills at the problem and get them on their way and forget about it. You know, that's that kind of approach. But also, um, it, it really, really did, after a while, particularly in some of these areas that we're talking about, uh, undermine any, any scruples the doctor brought to his profession. And so at a certain point, you find docs, you know, kind of 
taking a horrible advantage of these very vulnerable addicts um, uh, because they can, you know, and it's just available to them. And, and, and you find people getting into very, very sticky legal problems. Uh, we just had a woman out here convicted of murder, a doctor out here convicted of murder uh, for, for this. So it, it turns into a curse. It, it seems like a simple silver bullet solution to all these very complicated problems of how do you treat your patient's pain and what it really turns into, as most silver bullets do, in my opinion, a, 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 a horrible curse that ends up destroying lots of careers. And really, uh, uh, you know, you do make a lot of money if, if for, a, for a while, but after a while it all kind of, everyone knows you're a quack and, 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 and you're really not, you, you don't, you, you, the reasons you may have gotten into uh, to, to medicine are somehow clouded in, the, in, the, in this big fog of money and dope and, 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 and very desperate people. Well, you point out a lot of them went to jail um, for yeah. fraudulently dispensing. And they still do. There's still, uh, do- there's two doctors, there were several doctors in, in the Los Angeles area I could point to who are uh, going to jail or, or about to go to jail uh, um, because, because of this, you know. One of the most poignant, just heartbreaking parts of this book is you talk about the fact that after a while, the local pharmacy might not take the doctor's prescription because they know it's not real. And oh, so yeah. the users have to start driving two, 300 miles to get their fix of legal right. but destructive drugs, these opioids, these painkillers. And on the way, they're fantasizing about the fact that that three dollar payment is going to get them ten thousand because they're going to be able to sell it on the street, but they end up, of course, using it on the car on the way back and never really right. getting it, out of the you cycle. Know, this is the this is the most most complete form of personal slavery, uh, opiate addiction that I think we know um, uh, in in America uh, today, apart from just prison itself. Um, you know, it's it, it, people think. I have all these dreams, and then what's, re- what's really true is that this is uh, uh, this just deprives, as I said earlier, of, of all rational free will. Uh, and so you have the dope in front of you; you're just going to use it. Um, you know, it's the only way to really explain how a kid who would complain while sober before his addiction would complain about doing the most minor household chore gets addicted and and will thinks nothing of walking two miles in a snowstorm. To get his dope, um, it, you know, it, it's it's an amazing um, uh, 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 depriver of of personal liberty, unlike any other substance uh, that I am aware of, anyway. So we had Chris Arnotti on the program talking about some of these depressed areas in in Appalachia yeah. and elsewhere, and we had mm-hmm. Angus Deaton on as well, uh, talking about the rise in the death rate, which is uh, for the first time in American history. In a long, long time, anyway, that we've since been measured, probably the mortality rate for certain age groups has been rising. Particularly, uh, the the most surprising one recently was women, forty five to fifty four. And yet, your book is is maybe it's because it's the most heart wrenching part is is young people dying. And I mm-hmm. raised the question for listeners who remember those episodes, and I said, "This are these people killing themselves out of economic, you know, malaise, or is it?" What's it mean, a drug overdose? It's pretty clear from your book. A drug overdose is um, people who are trying to get high and don't realize how much you're taking, and eventually it just stops your heart. And, of course, there's a yeah. there's a coroner problem. Some of the coroners don't recognize it. They'll say heart attack is cause of death when it's really a drug-induced heart attack. Uh, there's a lot of silence yeah. around this. But talk talk about – what you think the significance of this is for the uh, our, our assessment of these economic problems. I'm going to throw in one more variable, which is, you know, these towns that you write about, some of them, particularly in the in the Appalachian region, and the episode I was mentioning before, they're very depressed economically. The best jobs have left. A lot of the factories are gone. Why do the people stay there? Why don't they? Why don't they leave? And instead, wow. they yeah. stay. They stay. <laughs> They take. They find this comfort, and it, some of them, I assume, survive. But but it kills some of them. It's it's a terribly, no, terribly exactly. Sad story. I, don't, I mean, I'm not sure. I I understand because rationally, there is no reason why you would stay. But there is more to just as I learned from, about Mexican immigration. There's more to Mexican immigration than pure uh, cost benefit analysis and dollar and cents. There's a lot sure. of of psychology sure. that goes into it, and and what makes me feel like a big man when I go back home. That's a big part of it. And I think there must be a lot of psychology goes into why folks don't leave 
uh, horribly depressed uh, economic areas. They don't know anything. They uh, about they don't know anything about any other area. They don't feel at home. Uh, they feel lost elsewhere. Um, Miss their sister. A, a lot of that, you know, goes into why they stay. I think. Yeah, miss their family. But do you think this? Is a problem – is this a particularly a female problem, 45 to 54? Your book doesn't seem to suggest that. No, I think I think this is a white problem. This is a white problem. It's not I, – I, we've been talking a lot about uh, Appalachia, but but really the places where you find most this mostly, I would bet, are, are in very nice uh, uh, well-to-do areas like uh, Charlotte, Portland, Salt Lake, Indianapolis, Minneapolis. These are areas that have done really, really well in, in the various economic – expansions and booms that we've had over the last, say, um, uh, well, since the mid-90s, basically. And, um, and so, no, I mean, I think this is a white uh, problem. That, that study that you referenced by Professor yeah, it's, Deaton. It's white women. Was, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's white men and women. And it's, it's basically, uh, if you'll note, that that, that transformation, that, that upturn begins in 1998. 1998, there's only one thing really that happened about that time. In the, in the United States that affected white people all across the country that would create a new increase in mortality among folks. And that is the expansion of opiate painkillers as, as the go-to pill for almost any kind of pain, massive supply of new opiates, a big black market, and a, and a very, very uh, scary rise in, in opiate addiction that we're now seeing. I mean, that's, if you look at that study, it's, it's 98, the crucial year, and there's only one thing that happened. Th- but that is not just in... Appalachia. That is not just in, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, the poor Rust Belt areas. It's uh, many, many well, well-to-do areas are 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 the, are the same way. It's a white problem. Well, let's close on a somewhat optimistic note, which, as your book does, which is the which is the following: um, the war on drugs has been remarkably uh, ineffective. Uh, it has it brings with it many, many, many negative things. Besides the fact that it it fails. And so it's very difficult to stop people from doing what they want to do, and it's very difficult mm-hmm. to stop entrepreneurial folks from doing what they can do. And so the supply of black tar heroin is still out there. The opioids on the street, it's not as quite – as they're not as available as they were before. There are new formulations being created that are, mm-hmm. that are trying to reduce the likelihood of, of abuse, the breaking them open that I mentioned earlier, et cetera. It's all kinds of – efforts to try to make the magic uh, the holy grail of the non-addictive painkiller which of course probably yeah. doesn't exist and you mention that in the book that it's probably just a pipe dream to use a bad metaphor but the, the the optimistic side of this is that there's a cultural problem too it's not just the fact that there's drugs available or that there's painkillers available that we have a certain emptiness at our core at times yeah. as human beings and this fills it and what's Again, poignant and moving and inspiring at the end of your book are the – what we would call civil society, uh, the attempts of parents and others to band together to try mm-hmm. to create efforts to rehabilitate, their, get their kids out of this problem, to try to get their kids from getting started on the problem. Uh, talk about some of the things that are going on that you see as hopeful, but even in these depressed areas that at yes, the end I, of the I book are somewhat is, cheerful. This is a story about isolation versus community. Really, this is, these drugs are the most isolating drugs. They thrive um, because we are, as Americans, are culturally so isolated from each other, whether in poverty or in wealth. doesn't matter, I don't think, really. Um, and, and so these drugs are almost like the heroin, certainly the poster drug for our era, uh, an era when, in which we are superficially connected to each other through social media and Internet and, and, and truly not connected uh, in any human sense or, or disconnected very, very, very widely, I would say, uh, across, across this country. And so um, I say at the end of, uh, of my, of the afterwards, my paperback book, that, that if this, um, you know, heroin may be actually a call to a kind of a community renewal. We have spent 35 years in this country exalting the private sector, destroying community, allowing the private sector, in my view, to, to destroy community in many, many areas. Jobs go overseas, a variety of things. It's a complicated story, but I mean, and we could talk about that, but I, I think what's happened in the last 35 years is we have seen communities destroyed. Uh, we've, we've, uh, we've built up brand new suburbia that's extraordinarily isolating. We call that prosperity. Uh, we have uh, demonized government and laughed at government and called it incompetent, not paid 
uh, taxes to support it. And we have a system, a, a, a situation now, in my opinion, where uh, yeah, yeah, having done all that, having exalted the private sector, demonized government, what, what we now have is a story in which the private sector has visited upon the United States of America and its people the most um, devastating uh, uh, threat to personal liberty that we know today, which is opiate opiate addiction. And for a long time, the only ones who were fighting that were um, were government officials, coroners, jailers, cops, public health nurses, uh, et cetera. That's changing now. So what you're seeing is that heroin is actually forcing us to kind of recognize our own isolation, our own uh, lack of community, and actually in those areas where it's hit hardest, in some of those areas where it's hit, hard, it's hit hardest, it has pushed people to cre- begin to create those bonds of community. Again, it, they're halting attempts. They don't always work. They're, they're, the people seem to be up against a lot of very potent forces that are keeping that, this from happening. But nevertheless, you, I, I begin to see this. Uh, as I've been traveling around talking about Dreamland to various small communities in America, I begin to see this kind of idea that that, that we need to kind of get to know each other again, that we need to um, do things in public, not always be afraid of the, what's outdoors and outside, but, but get the kids outside. Let them also skin their knees. We've been so afraid of the kids feeling any pain at all for a decade, a couple of decades now. And it, all it leads to is th- these kinds uh, of problems. So in, in the town of Portsmouth, Ohio, I spent a lot of time um, uh, for this book. I mean, uh, you know, people, there's a, there's a new cafe. There's, there's workout spaces that people are developing. There's, uh, uh, there's a, a, a new recovery movement in that town after years and years of so many people being addicted. A lot of them are now in recovery. It doesn't mean that there's no problems. In Portsmouth, it still faces a lot of economic hurdles and, and bad jobs, basically. Um, but but you kind of find in those areas that heroin has really visited and pummeled and opiates have pummeled, that there is this recognition that, that yeah, our communities have been devastated and it's now time to kind of work back towards a, a, a feeling of community and getting to know each other once again. That's That's the positive, I guess, that I would take out of all this. Well, I don't think – you might not be surprised to know that I, I don't agree with much of that. I agree with the last part a lot. Um, and I would say is to listeners that I only found about two paragraphs in this book uh, that I didn't agree with, uh, <laughs> which which is a very small number for, for the average book I read like this. So I would just add that I don't think that the exaltation of the private market and the disrespect for government is is the root of the problem. Uh, uh-huh. It hasn't stopped government from getting bigger since uh, over the last 30 or 40 years, and I don't think it's really the cause. I think the deeper problem is the cultural problem that you suggest, and I don't, I don't think we should look to Washington or Columbus, which is the capital of Ohio, for that feeling of community. I think we have to create it ourselves from the bottom up rather than from the top down. No, I, I would agree with that as well. I think that that's certainly true. That, that, that I, I, I was just telling a woman – uh, uh, who wanted to come have me speak and I, uh, in, in a part of Ohio, in fact, I was saying, you know, my feeling is that, that people in these counties, they have the answers, but so, for so long they've been laboring with uh, alone or uh, unaware of who else is working on these things or maybe not with the proper budget or a variety of issues. And it coming together, kind of finding that common ground is um, a crucial and, and, and the community feeling, getting to know sometimes, for example, public health, and cops don't know each other. That's crazy. In the one county, you know, you'll find people who just won't really know each other that well or won't know how to work together. Well, clearly, there's, there's, there's ground for those folks to come together and work on this topic. And really, really and, it's through, and there, it's there where, where the, um, the solutions, I believe, are, are, are already there. Um, I don't, when I give my speeches, I make sure I don't say, well, if you want to solve this problem, my policy prescriptions are one, two, three. I don't ever do that. I just say, look, it, it seems to me that a drug that is created and thrives on isolation, that the way to ad- attack it is, is uh, defeating it through community. And, and this is a problem that we have and, and, and our own isolation is a problem that we have been we've created for ourselves over many years now and forming a community to, to fight it can actually lead to enormous benefits, not just in the fight against dope, but in but in many, many other ways. And um, that's that's my message frequently when I'm when I'm out in these areas. My guest today has been Sam Quinones. The book is Dreamland. Uh, it's an extraordinary book. Uh, 
I, I recommend it highly. Sam, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for the chat. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.